Hello and welcome to the weekly Blackpool FC preview show. I'm Jed Mills and coming up today, we'll reflect on Blackpool's last two draws against Lincoln City and Accrington Stanley. Plus, we'll look ahead to Saturday's game with Sunderland. We'll catch up with former pool favourites Mickey Walsh and David Vaughan. Neil Critchley discusses this weekend's opponents. Plus, Elliot Embleton talks about his time on loan from the Stadium of Light. Well, back in the studio with me this week is former Blackpool striker Brett Ormerod. Brett... Let's look at these last two games then, two draws yeah. against Lincoln City. I mean, it, it could have been a, a lot more. And a bit, again, another frustrating afternoon, really, another late goal. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it depends where you look at it. You know, obviously Blackpool is one of the best away performances of the season, being 2-0 up, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, Lincoln conceding two goals, especially late on with the second. And, and it feels like a loss where, you know, if you flip it on its head, if they were 2-0 down and come back, it would feel like a win. But... End of the day, it's, um, it's, an, it's, a, it's a good away point and uh, you know, it kept the run going. Yeah, and that unbeaten run, it is all about momentum, isn't it, at this stage? And you know all about that, the runs that you've been on to get into sort of the, the next division. Probably. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there are, um, I think it's 15 games unbeaten now, or something like that. So, um, you know, it's uh, confidence levels will be high. Um, you know, um, so um, yeah, they've just got to try and keep it going, but they're hitting form at the right time of the season. Ellie Sims as well, really good goal against Lincoln. Yeah, fantastic. You know, he's going from strength to strength. He's still only a young lad, you know, 20 year old, um, and that, and using his body to really good uh, effect against um, Lincoln. So, and um, turn and, and put another fantastic finish. The last time I seen him, you know, he scored a great goal as well against Swindon a few weeks ago. So, he's, uh, you know, he's certainly going from strength to strength. Got a good future, hasn't he? Like I said, he's got that athletic prowess about him, he's got that size, and We've talked about this before a little bit, the way that he's in proper football now, not academy football, and really that's where you do your learning. Yeah, and that's why he's coming here, you know, to get a valuable experience, and I think he is, but, um, you know, I think he's got five goals now, which is a fantastic return. You've got to remember, he's only 20, he's only young, but, you know, uh, he's, he's getting better with every game, and, uh, you know, that should stand him in good stead for, uh, for later on in his career. I know you watched the, the Accrington game as well. Yep. Again, maybe turn that on its head, that penalty save from Maxwell could have been defeat, it wasn't turned out to be a draw. Again, was that the good point, if you will? Yeah, I mean, Blackpool didn't play bad. Um, you know, I, look, I looked at that game, um, you know, a, a lot, and uh, it was a, a tactically it was a fascinating game. Mm -hmm. To be fair, um, you know, Accrington changed the, the system that they used to. You know, obviously, getting beat five 0 at the weekend, five one, sorry, off Wimbledon at home. So they worked, you know, a lot on the defensive and trying to stifle Blackpool. And to be honest, he did that to really good effect. Which um, you know, but Blackpool still they had to work. They, you know, I think they created three or four chances, for, you know, due, uh, through in the game. But they had to work extremely hard to get them chances. And uh, Sully Kai Kai, you know, created a, a really good opportunity early on. And if that had gone in, it probably it might have been a different game. But you know, you've got to give credit to Accrington. They, they you know they came here and they, and they, they ended up stifling Blackpool. Do you think you're going to get more teams doing that? You know, Blackpool unbeaten right in form at the moment especially at this time of the season you're going to get teams coming here for example thinking right a point's a good point and, and doing that a lot yeah I mean from you know I think from Accrington's point of view it was just stop the rot you know because they have confidence with law um, but they get, they've got a few more play, they've had a few more players back against Blackpool than they have in the previous weeks um, you know they've been pretty ravaged by injury but you know, like I say it wasn't a bad performance because Blackpool had to be patient they still kept the ball moving and they still created the best chances and um, you know Luke Garber uh, hit the post late on mm. um, um, you know, Kaka had a fantastic opportunity again with a little flick from Jerry Yates. So, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of pluses, but, the, you know, they could have lost it at the end if it hadn't been for a what, you know, was an absolutely fantastic save from Chris Maxwell. Yeah, I mean, how good has Maxwell been? He, he, we talked to him on the preview show. He's talked about how, you know, this is the, the, the sort of best he's felt at a football club. And, and that sort of confidence, it shows as yeah. well as being captain, he's kind of really stepped up this year. He has done, and, uh, you know, that's why Neil Critchley's made him captain. Um, you know, he brings a lot of uh, qualities. He's one of the, um, the older players in the squads now. Um, but, he, you know, he's, he's a good personality. He's a good lad to have around the dressing room. You know, and he's, he's, um, he's, he's fantastic. And, and that save, you know... It, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, it was straight at him and that it wasn't straight <laughs> at him. He, he had to get down, it was right at him with pace and he's died. He's had to get his arm down there and keep the ball out. I thought it was a, a fantastic save and, and a save that keeps the run going. Well, it's Sunderland next up for the Seasiders and a particular goal from Mickey Walsh in 1975 always brings back fond memories for Blackpool supporters. The forward who won the BBC Match of the Day goal of the season for that strike against the Black Cats has been reflecting on his time at Bloomfield Road as well as that special goal. Mickey, thank you for joining us on the preview show. Let's start firstly with how you are at the moment. 
I'm good, thanks. Yeah, you know, I had a stroke about uh, it's three years, just three years now. So I was fortunate at the time. Uh, Christine was great. We were in Brazil, as you do. Uh, and uh, I, I felt unwell and got rushed to hospital. And like I say, it was all sort of very, very well done. Uh, and then I spent convalescing time. I was three weeks in Brazil and then repatriated to the UK. And since then, it's uh, physio, hard work, you know, trying to get back to fitness like you would as a football player, you know. But, uh, yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm doing sort of four or five K a day now. Uh, I've got a, a stick that helps me, so sort of helps me around with my balance and stuff. So, yeah, I'm good. Health-wise, good. But I'm in England at the moment. I've been in lockdown like all of us, I suppose. Uh, we came over to sort of... Uh, for Christmas, really, beginning of December, with a view to going back after Christmas. And uh, it never happened. We got locked down, and which is probably better because we got family around. And if we'd been in Portugal, you know, we, we wouldn't have had that. So uh, it's like everybody, we're just waiting for a time when we can probably go back. I've had the first injection, me and Christine have had our first injections. Uh, we're due our second any day now. And once we've got that, I think we'll probably be able to go back to Portugal in, in May time. So obviously, mentions of Sunderland will always bring back the clips of that goal in 1975, that goal of the season. Yeah. How much do you, do you love seeing that goal and being reminded of that goal? Because it became so synonymous with your career, didn't it? Absolutely. You don't realise at the time what's happening, you know? Um, I was fortunate because uh, there weren't many uh, games transmitted um, it was obviously a uh, match of the day and it was a second division game not a top Premier League game so it was, uh, it was fortunate that they were there and uh, you know you don't think at the time that it's going to live with you for the rest of your life and everyone's going to remember it uh, so if I mentioned Mickey Walsh this straight away <laughs> mind you it used to be I, I saw you and I was there and and it was my dad was at the game. <laughs> was my granddad used to be at the game when he, when he scored that goal. But it's synonymous with my name and it's one of the greatest things that could have happened to me. But I did score other goals, you know. <laughs> I got one on the, against Norwich, which I've never been able to see on the telly since. But it was covered, and, you know. But, uh, yeah, good times, good times. Just in terms of that Sunderland goal, was it always that one thing in your mind the minute you pick the ball up just inside their half to drive forward and, and have a pop at goal? Oh, absolutely. Once I once once we were under under the cosh, uh, or if it was a corner against us, I'd be left up up, up front on my own or marked by two guys probably. Uh, and I always felt as though if we break quick, I, I could score. And when that's my mindset at the time. Even defending a corner, I was thinking, I'm going to score here. <laughs> and Hart didn't look a great ball. I speak to Paul Hart, now and again, Paul Hart, and uh, he claims it as an assist. And he, I said, you just knocked it upfield, don't worry about that. I did all the work. <laughs> so he, we have a bit of laugh about that, you know. But it was important at the time, the big games. And uh, the funny story to that was I signed in 71. Um, and it always says I was at Blackpool from 73 to 78, but I signed pro at 71. I made my debut in 73. Uh, and uh, uh, Bob Stoker was the manager. But before I got into the first team, Bob had left and gone to Sunderland. But by the time he, when he returned in 78, I think it was, the club had already agreed for me to go to Everton. So I signed for him and he, and he sold me and I never played a game for him. You know, and all that, that's from 71 to 78. So, you know, and it, obviously Bob was manager of Sunderland as well, wasn't it? You know. You mentioned those times, you mentioned Paul Hart, George. You can go through it, can't you? Alan Suddick. There's so many players there that have become sort of Hall of Fame members for, for Blackpool, but it's incredible when you look back how great those players were but never got that promotion no we were so close we we're so close and there are reasons why I think uh, you know they broke the, they broke they were all young kids coming through together a bit like the Man United's and uh, if we'd have stuck together I think we, we could have achieved great things and it wasn't necessarily the players leaving it was there was a bit of backroom unrest and stuff and Alan Brown got sacked and they wouldn't give a contract to 
Stevie Harrison and Alan Ainsco and then they sold Harty and then they sold me, you know, so it wasn't quite stable in, in, in the background. And if it could have been strong enough and to keep us all together and uh, you, who knows, who knows what might have happened. Obviously, towards the last couple of seasons, you struck up an amazing partnership with, with Bob Hatton. How did that work? Did you work on that? Was that just natural? Oh, it was It was like radar. We were just uh, made for each other. We were, we were very similar in style. Probably all round. We had an all round game, you know. Um, and it's when you played two up front, you know, one would come short, the other go long. And if it didn't get delivered, you would change it round again, the other one would go short other guy would go along, you know, so we just kept working in tandem, the channels really, and then one would hold it up and then we'd get in the box. And But it was like radar. We just knew each other's movements. And without the ball, we both worked re really hard for the team, you know, as a pair. Uh, and there was no sort of real egos, you know, Alan Ainsco was a great player, great runner, great worker, honest as the days long. We had good lads and, and young-ish lads you know we were all mates together off the field as well so it, it was a fantastic time fantastic time in my career you know well Brett let's first of all talk about Mickey Walsh great to see him in in good health after you know what he's been through recently yeah you know I, I spoke to him a few years ago the first time I was at Blackpool in 2001 um, you know he's a legend he's Mickey Walsh here um, my dad I used to have the old 101 great goals <laughs> on uh, VHS what my dad bought me once for Christmas in late 80s so um, you know that goal I've I've seen that a lot, a lot of times, and uh, it's great to see him, you know, recovering after uh, lots of serious um, illness. Was it one of those as well when you used to meet him here, especially just memories flooding back for him all the time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he's synonymous with his football club. You know, um, he's probably the first real player when I was a kid who I, who I knew played for Blackpool. Um, you know, obviously being from Blackburn. So um, yeah, but like I said, that goal's iconic because uh, I had it on videotape along with a lot. But my dad, you know, bought me and uh, I've watched it a lot, a lot of times. Well, so when we offer that goal as well, it, he, he does look, when he celebrates, he does look yeah. surprised that, he, what, yeah. have you talked to him about that goal? Um, no, I haven't actually, but, yeah. um, you know, I should have mentioned it years ago, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, could, I can hear the commentator in my head, uh, you know, I've watched it that many times, so I can lip read the commentator, to be honest, but um, yeah, I mean, I just remember he chopped onto his right foot and uh, turned it onto his left and he struck it and just gave a goalkeeper no chance and, you know, you can see the euphoria of the fans uh, jumping on the pitch afterwards. Well, our next guest represented both Blackpool and Sunderland during his career. David Vaughan achieved promotion alongside this man with the Seasiders in 2010. Going on to make more than 100 appearances for the club, here he is looking back on those times. Probably the best seasons of my career, really. Um, you know, it was a really good atmosphere around the club at the time, it was, especially in the uh, within the team. And, you know, things just took off and it was really enjoyable. I think uh, it was good for everyone, the fans and players and staff all alike, so it was uh, some, some good memories. When you joined the club, you swapped Spain for, for Blackpool. How would you reflect on that that time overseas? Because obviously you didn't play as many games as you would have wanted, but I take you have no regrets from going sampling football internationally? No, not at all. No, I really enjoyed it though. Um, although I didn't really play, it was, it was frustrating at the time and you know I wanted to get back over to England really because I just had a young, young uh, baby, so that was an issue there, but uh, we'd looking back, it was a good experience, and it's um, sort of helped me uh, in other clubs that I went to, and in, in, in also in my coaching as well. So it was, a, it was a good experience to do. Yeah, you came through a very technical academy at Crew, and then you go and play in a country that's very technical in in Spain. Did Blackpool reap the benefits of that? Uh, I don't know. You have to ask the Blackpool fans, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, so I'll probably when. Uh, the gaffer came in, Holloway, he pushed me more into the central role, which suited my game and somewhere I'd never really played a, a lot before. So it kind of, the two things uh, sort of went well together. And then like, I was probably played some of the best football in my career at Blackpool and, you know, playing in the system and the way we played suited me uh, perfectly, really. Yeah, it's probably easy to forget that because you were more sort of like wide left of a four-man midfield when you, you first joined Blackpool. Yeah, and uh, Simon Grayson, he brought me in, I think, to replace uh, Wes Hulang, which is obviously he was a good player and did a good job at Blackpool, so it was a difficult uh, sort of shoes to fill. But um, I enjoyed playing under, under Simon Grayson, but really when Holloway came in, it, it all took off, and especially for me and a few other players. 
you mentioned adapting to that more central position. What were the, the main differences that you had to get used to? Because obviously you were more on the ball, weren't you? Yeah, just being more involved in the play and sort of your defensive duties more than anything. But obviously, like touched on it before, coming through crew, you, you get a good education of not just of where you play, but other positions and other roles. So I kind of knew what, what was expected, is just getting used to getting used to it week in, week out, really. How did you find that sort of switch that summer? Because Ian Holloway comes in and does some presentations, talks about Spain and Barcelona and playing like that. As a group, it was it was probably hard to get your heads around at first, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. There was uh, some interesting meetings there, especially early on. But uh, when he was talking, it was it was sort of music to my ears, really, the way I wanted to play, because I knew it would suit me and it was just the way I'd been brought up to play. So it was, um, I was just hoping to get a sort of a good... Uh, part to play in it really and which ended up being the case so it was, it was enjoyable overall Talk us through that midfield trio of yourself Charlie Adam Keith Southern it seems like each facet of the game all worked and blended and become this sort of like famous midfield three with Blackpool fans Yeah it's, it was good yeah obviously we all got different qualities and strengths so it, it worked well together and um, you know, was, I think we all had a good work ethic and tried to work together but like, like I said you know, uh, Charlie obviously was more attacking than me and Keith, and probably I was more technical than Keith. So it's kind of all blended in quite well, and um, the mixture was just was good at the time and um, worked well within the team. You're someone who's always let your, your football do the talking. You you didn't really mind that, did you? That the attention sort of stayed off you at times. Yeah, <laughs> it's not really my uh, favourite thing to do interviews, but um, yeah, just try and stay under the radar a little bit and just like you say, let your football do the talking and just. Enjoy, enjoy that side of it. You've been part of several dressing rooms, but how unique that one that you played in at Blackpool? Yeah, it's very unique. Um, you know, we all had not similar backgrounds, but similar sort of um, careers, journeys. So it was all uh, sort of that brought us to brought us together, and um, the circumstances around Blackpool, you know, as well documented. So that sort of bonds you even more. So um, you know, try and try. And, do something special as a group. Really. I know it was obviously tough to, to decide to leave when you did and if the circumstances would have been different, you'd, have, you'd probably stayed. You moved on to to Sunderland. How, how do you reflect on your time with, with the Mackhams? Yeah, it was it was up and down really. I did enjoy it initially to start with and then obviously I didn't play as much as I would have liked to, but I had some good times and, and bad times. It's, you know, it's a really big club and a good fan base. Uh, just, we had a, I think the first season we did fairly well and then after that we were in relegation but almost in the next two seasons so it was a bit of a tough time but um, yeah on other times there's you know, some good occasions so not not all too bad. Both of your clubs go head to head this weekend and it's a, a really tight clash isn't it at the you know the top end of, of the division? Yeah uh, I've been keeping a bit of an eye on it obviously Blackpool are doing well this season and the Critch had a bit of a Bit of a dodgy start, but then they've picked up recently and got some good results. And uh, Sunderland, something similar. You mentioned Neil Quixley there. He's, he's somebody you know from from your connections with Crew. Yeah, I was Quixley's a little bit older than me, but came through the youth systems. Um, I think he's played a, or trained in a few sessions with him, and then uh, he went into the coaching side of it. So he was just used to see him fairly often around around the place as used starting his coaching uh, journey really in the lower, in the youth teams and then obviously progressed as, as time went on. You're now back at crew coaching the under 13s. Yeah. Is that is that the pathway that you see? I know you've, you've looked at a few avenues within football, but is it is it more the sort of like the, the general coach and some of the other roles rather than necessarily management? Yeah, I think so for now. Um, so not got great experience in coaching and management so I'm uh, just trying to learn my trade really and see see where it takes me and see what sort of roles I enjoy doing and how I can most be most effective really. Well Brett I mean good to see David Vaughan how much do you keep in contact with him? Uh, we still have a WhatsApp group we all we all the squad to be honest um, you know so um, it's uh, they're great lads I mean Vaughan he was fantastic uh, fantastic player and uh, you know the special time for, for us all really at this club. 
And, and he wasn't the most outspoken, as in what we would see as yeah. fans. You didn't know him as the, the, the outgoing guy, the loud guy, but what was he really like? He was, you know, he's a great sense of humour, Vaughn. I got on with him really well, but he was quiet, you know, he wasn't uh, loud in any way. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you're talking about talent and good feet, you know, and, um, yeah, I mean, he was part of that midfield, which is one of the best I've ever played with. Um, Charlie, Keith and, and Vaughn, they complimented each other so well. They were all very different, but all had vital roles to play. And uh, you know he, he was a massive part of it, a massive part of our squad. But yeah, off the field, very quiet and stuff. Unless we went out for a beer, and then you know he's like he'd been let loose. So um, <laughs> yeah, fantastic lad. And came in from Real Sociedad as well, and to replace sort of Wes Houlihan on, on the left. But quickly realised that well, Ian Holloway quickly realised that wasn't his best position. Here. Yeah, I mean he came in um, with big shoes to fill. You know, Wes, fans' favourite. You know, great servant, fantastic player. Um, and he did, he came in, I think Chris Coleman had signed him for Sociedad when he'd gone out there. So, um, you know, coming here when I came back to the club in, in January, um, he was playing on the left. Probably, it wasn't his best position, obviously, by no means. And, um, you know, I think it was a bit, um, a bit alien to him, which is <laughs> ironic. But, um, yeah, um, you know, once Holloway came in and he, he, he brought his style of playing and, um, you know, he had the, we, we, we signed Chaz on a permanent, he had that midfield, you know, uh, three of them in midfield that they work so well, the understanding between the three of them, uh, you know, and um, and that was, was the, the best I played under. So, um, yeah, what a fantastic player and what a fantastic lad. When he moved into the, the middle, did, did you realise when him, Keith and Charlie were that sort of trio, did you think, yeah, this is, this is a, you know, a special sort of trio? With yeah, them? I mean, he was always, yeah, I mean, you know, you knew what the quality of player he was, in you know, because we trained with him every day, but... Um, I think, and, and same with Keith, you know, Keith was a battling midfielder, had a few injuries, you know, Chaz had probably faced a fell out at, at, at Rangers, he came in that the season I'd come in and, and done well, uh, but I don't know, there was, it was just like, um, you know, making a cake, I suppose, that, that special mixture, and he'd added something special all the way, you know, sprinkled a bit of his magic on it, and, uh, you know, they, all three of them flourished, but, the, you know, the whole team did in the system that we were playing, so... Um, yeah, it would just it, it just complemented each of them for their own individual qualities and, and as a collective, um, you know, and it, it was it was uh, fantastic. It's fair to say he was a, a bit of an, an unsung hero. I don't think so because I think the fans appreciated him. You know, mm. I think um, it wasn't as like I said because he was so quiet off the field and um, you know, but he, you know he had his moments. Did did Vaughan? I had a great laugh with him. I had a really good, you know, and I still do. Um, but um, as a, as a talent, it was it was fantastic and uh, it, it brought the best out of all of us. Well, ahead of Saturday's game with Sunderland, Neil Critchley shared his thoughts. The name speaks for itself. Um, well, you know, fantastic football club, um, a manager with experience, um, come in and you know they've their results have improved. Um, they've got a quality squad of players. Um, you've only got to look at the bench and who they've got available to them. It's it's very strong, um, and. You know, whilst they're in this league, there's an expectation for them to, to get out of this league. Um, and everyone at Sunderland will know that. Um, they, they want to be much higher than League One and uh, they'll be desperate to do that this season. Um, however, they've they've lost their last couple of games, which not ideal for them. Does that help us? Who knows? Who knows? A wounded animal. We, see, we saw that with Accrington on Tuesday night. It can be dangerous. Um, what, what I do know is they've got good players and they're a good team and we'll have to play very well to, to win um, but against the, the top teams this season the top two anyway Hull and Peterborough we've taken points off both of them so um, hopefully we can do that against Sunderland And it's now an earlier kick-off does that affect your preparation that much? Um, not really, no um, sometimes we train in the afternoon um, at a similar time to when we're kicking off so the players are, um, say, more used to reporting and tr and training at that time, so it won't it won't be a big difference to us now. Um, come half past twelve, we'll be motivated, we'll be fresh, we'll have our plan, and we'll be ready. Hey, coach Neil Critchley, there ahead of this weekend, Brett. I mean, these are massive games, aren't they, against Sunderland, and and playing them twice in ten days, which is pretty unusual. Yeah, um, you know, I look at Sunderland, and I think they've got the strongest squad in the league. Um, you know, they've got um, one of the best players in Aidan McGeady. In my opinion, you know, shouldn't be in this league, but you know, he's been at Sunderland, and, and they've fell in 
into um, a bit of disarray over the last couple of seasons. But you know, you'd still look at the resources. You know, massive club financially and you know fan base and stuff. So you know, they're always going to be up there. Probably, for, in my opinion, are still underachieved because I think um, with that with that kind of squad and and um, and you know fans backing and stuff, they should they should be winning this league. But they've got a new manager in. They've had several. They're trying to find that <laughs> you know that right formula. Um, and, and they're getting there, so um, it'll be a very, very tough game for Blackpool. If they can, you know, get positive results, I mean, how much positivity would that give to Blackpool looking up the table? Well, if you suddenly, I mean, they've lost the last two games, you know, so it's, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not the perfect football team, that's for sure. And Blackpool are in probably the, the fourth team in the league, you know, unbeaten in 15. So, you know, I think Blackpool will be quite confident and um, and looking and letting Sunderland worry about them rather than the, the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to that one. Well, one man who won't feature this weekend is Elliot Embleton, currently on loan from Sunderland. He's made 13 appearances so far and he's enjoying his time by the seaside. I've enjoyed it. Came in, obviously, at the end of January and been in around the squad the whole time and eventually started to get a good few starts. So, and we're winning. So the main thing. And Neil Critchick said a few weeks ago that you felt that you were a bit of an under-the-radar sign in January and that you can be a big player for the, for the team between now and the end of the season. That must feel good working under a head coach who has that much faith and confidence in you. Definitely when you've got the confidence behind you and you know he's backing you when you go out on the pitch it, it does give you a boost and obviously when we're one own beat and run as well and that gives us a lot of confidence going into games. And you've come here to get a fair amount of game time. How important do you think game time is to, to help a player develop further in their career? Oh, massive. Um, from when you play 23s football to getting out in uh, professional leagues, League Two, League One, like, it's a massive development because that's where you, you learn most of, your, most of your stuff in professional games. And you scored your first goal for the club in the form win over Gillingham a few weeks ago. Is that something that you want to improve in your career as, as your career goes on, score more goals and be more um, of a threat going forward? Definitely. Um, obviously scored one, probably could have had another two or three uh, if I'd be shooting boots on, but uh, yeah, hitting the back of the net is uh, important for the team and obviously it's good to, good to get a goal for yourself as well. And 15 games unbeaten now after Tuesday's draw with Accrington. Confidence in the squad must be really high at the moment. Oh, really high. Like, I think we've only we've been beat once since I've been here, and that was the first game. So since then, I'm not sure how many wins it is, but we've climbed from 15th to we're up to fourth. I think we're now fifth or sixth, so we're still going well and a lot of play for still. And looking ahead to Saturday, your parent club Sunderland come into town. That's a club that you've come through their academy and gone on to represent the first team. You must have a lot of yeah. love and affection for them. Yeah, obviously been there since I was six, seven year old and played through every age group and to obviously have a to get a professional contract there and then go on to make my debut is is a massive achievement and obviously that's been my club for a very long time. Well, let's talk about Elliot Embleton. For me, we talked about David Vaughan being that sort of unsung hero. Yeah. I've really liked watching Elliot Embleton. Anytime he's appeared, I just think he brings that sort of reassurance to the team as well. What, what have you made of him when he's made those appearances? He's done well. I mean, he's, um, you know, the last couple of games I've watched, he's been out on the right, which, um, you know, um, you've got to force your way in the team in, in, in a way. He's, you know, he's a very clever player. Like you say, he's a bit like David Vaughan. He's got fantastic feet, good vision, can set things up and, uh, and stuff. Um, when I, you know, he's, uh, I think he's one who's when he's played at Sunderland especially, he's played in behind the striker, you know, and got shots off, but he's found his cell on the right wing and, uh, but he's, you know, he's settled down and he's, uh, he's putting in some really, really good performances. Going to be a big miss this weekend. Oh well, yeah, I mean, but, you know, I think Neil Critchley knew about that, you know, <laughs> that was the agreement when he came out on loan. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've no, I've no um, hesitation in thinking that Neil Critchley has long prepared for that. Is that the one good thing about this squad as well? And we have seen it, and we've, he's had to do it, hasn't he, Neil Critchley, with the, the games being sort of Saturday, Tuesdays, is that, yes, he's going to miss Embleton, but the amount of choice he's got in this squad, again, it's, it's a good headache to have. Yeah, I mean, he's still got a, a good squad. You know, he's obviously missing players like CJ Amelson, who, who give you a totally different option with, with that. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's fantastic pace. But, um, you know, whatever team Neil Critchley puts out, you know, they're in good form. Um, they're playing well, they're winning games, they're on un an unbeaten run, probably one of the longest one. I, d I don't think I was ever involved in anything like that at Blackpool in an unbeaten sense. Um, 
you know, in, in both my spells. So, um, you know, there's a lot to be confident about. And I think it'll be someone that won't be relishing playing Blackpool, that's for sure. Does that mindset change when you, when you go on a, a, a run that you think every game you're so desperate? We saw Maxwell's save, you know, it's that desperation not to put that L against that fixture. And that's, that's what you sort of mindset you get into. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, you said there's, there's some of the season defining moments and, and Chris Maxwell's save could have well have been that. Because at Blackpool, you're thinking, well, you know, we've, we've had the best chances. You know, Accrington have been resolute uh, and they've gone and, and won a penalty right at the death. And probably last season, you know, Accrington would have scored that. But Chris Maxwell, what a save. I mean, you know, I, I said, I've said it before, but when you look at it, you, you've got to look at it, you know, in slow motion to really appreciate the strength and to keep hold of it. You know, it could have easily bounced out off him and gone back to Colby Bishop and he'd had a tap in. So, um, but, the, you know, it keeps the run going and, and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, confidence is high and it should be. Finally, Blackpool's fixture this weekend is dedicated to Charity Mind for better mental health. We all have mental health and need to look after it just as we would our physical health. Well, every year, one in four of us will experience a mental health problem. That's hundreds of football players and thousands of football fans. That's why we're working in partnership with Mind and the EFL to raise awareness of mental health, to improve the approach to mental health and to raise funds to deliver life-changing support. If you want to get involved and support Lancashire Mind, you can purchase just one of these mind pin badges in club colours from the club shop or get involved in the Lancashire Mind 5 for 5 challenge. Well here are Sully Kai Kai and Elliot Embleton showing you how it's done. Hi my name is Sully Kai Kai, I'm with Embo and this is our Lancashire Mind 5 for 5 challenge. Nominate 5, donate 5. That's a great initiative there. Well, get involved with the 5 for 5 challenge yourself and nominate your friends to get involved too. For further information and for all the support groups out there, please check the club's social media channels. Well, thanks for joining us today. Remember, kick-off this Saturday is at the earlier time of 12.30. You can tune in to Blackpool's game with Sunderland live by purchasing an iFollow match pass from the club's official website. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next week.